we are excited to have you and excited to have Steve Rainey. So uh, Steve and I have actually worked together on a few different things, so I was excited that he was willing to come participate. And he has a, a great vision of helping to transform. And by the way, knows, knows pretty much everybody in the transportation space in Silicon Valley and beyond. So um, I'm excited to see what he has here tonight. And he has, he's, he's enthusiastic for the Q&A portion of it as well. So save up your hard questions. Uh, we can play the game of try to stump, stump Steve. <laughs> uh, go ahead and give a round of applause for Steve Rainey. Current climate law has a modest influence on things. It's a modest change driver. 
but there's a second round coming uh, this year that's going to crank it up a bit, so that may become more influential. And California has some of the best climate laws around. And unfortunately, the poor are in SOC 2 and gentrification in high rents in San Francisco is pushing people way out of San Francisco to the edges of the Bay Area. And then high-speed rail is, I think, going to continue to be a zombie for about 10 years, neither dead nor alive, neither funded nor killed. Um, so, back to 2020, when Highway 101 breaks with gridlock, we're going to need to increase the price of driving to motivate behavior change. And this is the topic that's like getting the kid to eat their spinach when they don't like spinach. Right? Um, but we know for Bay Area commuting, when you have free parking at work and your single occupancy vehicle SOV commute mode is 77% when you charge the parking, it's half of that. So we know this changed behavior. So pricing works. It's not super popular, but once you have pricing in place, then the mobility ecosystem is going to expand at critical mass. So it's a very good thing for some of the startups around here. Uh, but you might be skeptical because 75% of California voters oppose a quarter gas tax increase. So my sense is that compared to the do nothing option that produces gridlock in 2020, there are a couple pricing policies that have a good chance of winning that are the least worse, the least bad tasting mm -hmm. spinach. If you might, uh, Stanford's program where they charge employees a reasonable amount to commute by single occupancy vehicle, and they take that revenue and they get it for their Marguerite shuttle bus and for Caltrain Go Passes is a pretty good <coughs> policy and is less uh, socially unjust than other policies. So I think that's going to be crucial in driving increases in things like biking. I think we're going to see some great advances and in increases in biking coming up. And the cities are now beginning to compete against each other to see who's got the best bike plan and who can make biking a little more safe and fun. Um, but in Amsterdam, we've got 30% of Amsterdamers commuting by bike. And it's cold and rainy there. Of course, Americans are really wusses, right? <laughs> it's just it's cheap and effective. Uh, not the social norm in the U.S. Um, and then some of the public policy in the Bay Area is trying to push from the average vehicle miles traveled, BMT per capita in the U.S. is about 26 per day, and go to about a third of that by more efficient human settlement patterns. And so Plan Bay Area is one of the good planning areas that's trying to bring more of these kind of people about, low driving, and I, sort of the ideal South Bay resident is somebody who lives and shops in downtown Palo Alto, walks a lot, they get a hook and go grocery cart to go get their groceries because they don't have a trunk in their car, they commute via Caltrain, and they own fewer cars. And uh, another big part of this is increasing the quantity of housing, and a real breakthrough is in small square footage micro units um, because then you can get the price per unit down and have things be affordable and you really have to have great Designed to make 350 square foot livable. Right? Another thing that's going to happen is mobility as a service. So, this is a single app that glues all the mobility services, Lyft and Uber and public transit together seamlessly. So, by multimodal trip planning, you envision you live in San Francisco and you take Lyft line to Caltrain, from Caltrain, you come to Mountain View Caltrain, and then you get a bike share from there. And you can pre book those three different segments in advance and pay for them easily with a single app um, and have a nice customer centered experience. And for some of the employers, they will expose, they will feature, um, say, the Google buses for commuting, or Stanford would feature their Marguerite shuttle bus. And um, for Stanford, they give you the free go pass to take Caltrain. So the pricing that a Stanford employee would have through this app would be different than what the average consumer would have. So this actually has a pretty sophisticated back end, integrating all these different apps, and they have pay by phone parking, which is important, and also with integrate where the employers are providing commute subsidies and changing the price of things that can filter through as well. And then for Google Now and Microsoft Cortana experience, this is faster than real time. So this is reading your calendar, your emails, and figuring out before you even know it 10 minutes in advance that you need an Uber and getting it there at the door waiting for you. Right? So this is your super smart uh, concierge 
robotic concierge thing for you. Uh, great progress in the smartphone app space, and we're the smartphone mobility headquarters. And <coughs> for critical mass, some of these apps are poaching taxi riders and public transit riders, which is kind of a clever approach. And so Uber and Lyft combined in the Bay Area are carrying about 140,000 passenger trips per day, which is massive and leads to an amazing market capitalization. But the Bay Area has 28 million trips per day. So Uber and Lyft are just kind of noise in the scheme of things. So the South Bay is only serving about one-tenth of one percent of all the trips. But potentially with pricing, we can crank that up. Um, and Uber has the stated intent to get rid of all their drivers and replace them with robots. And that would bring the price down further. Um, and Lyft Line and Uber Pool are pretty important innovations where you can carpool with some random stranger for half the cost. And again, you're making the system more efficient, but you're putting two or three passengers in a car rather than one. Um, and they've got critical mass in San Francisco, so that's working really well. And again, the pricing, we can maybe bring critical mass down to the South Bay for this. Um, Chariot is a van service from the Marina District in San Francisco to downtown San Francisco. There's the pay by phone parking app. Um, now on to the electric vehicle story. Um, about 10% of the new car sales in California are plug-in hybrids or hybrids or electric vehicles. And Stanford's Mark Jacobson has argued that we need to electrify most of our car fleet to hit our climate targets, and the state seems to have adopted that program. So the question is really, how do we increase new car sales well beyond 1.3% electric vehicles? And there's some great products on the market, some great incentives, and I think we're going to need some more incentives as well to keep market share going up. But the products are going to improve and improve over time. And I predict a 3% range increase for the same price for batteries in the next three years. And so your LEAF will go to having more than 200 mile charging range, so it will eliminate range anxiety, which will be enabling and really help crank up the market. So I have some optimism that the target mile per gallon in 2025 for the new car fleet, we can actually go beyond that because you know, a LEAF is like 120 mile per gallon equivalent. So if we sell enough of those, we can maybe bust through that, which will be pretty amazing. A um, couple predictions about car safety and e-scooters. So from Richard Bishop's previous media talk, if you were there for that, um, non-robotic cars are going to get much safer as well, so all the stupid things humans do, you can kind of guide people away from that. So a lot fewer fatalities on just your standard car, which can be provided inexpensively. And then, for me, it's really important to have a 25-pound scooter electric thing for your Caltrain commute, so you can have a first-mile experience, carry it in the seat with you, and then have a last-mile experience. And there's all sorts of variations on this. And again, in Amsterdam, you don't actually need to electrify the bikes, but in America, you do. <laughs> so there's an electric bike for horses. <clears throat> but it's, you know, really, it's the market where you don't want to sweat on the way into work. Right? It's actually a legitimate thing here. This is very cool electric unicycle when it comes with training wheels. So <laughs> don't just it right away. It's very inexpensive. It's 25 pounds. And then the Eco Reco Eco uh, Reco scooter is manufactured in San Jose, and that folds up as well, so that's a pretty good Caltrain last mile solution. And a lower tech, but um, instrumental in changing community behavior, I think. That would give me my completely incorrect timeline for how autonomous vehicles roll out. So 2017, GM Super Cruise, where you have kind of a hands-free, uh, foot-free driving experience, but you still have to pay attention, so that's an amazing technological achievement but it's not that exciting to the consumer. And Nissan says they're gonna hit it even faster than that. And then 2020 is when I talked about having that congestion pricing kick in, and that's really sort of the main change driver in the Bay Area, rather than the <coughs> 2022 is when there's this, this Audi woman here can uh, read a magazine, and so that you can really monitor to that. Um, and then in 2025, 5% of the cars will have this capability on the freeways. And that means greenhouse gas is going to increase, and <coughs> is going to increase from induced demand impacts. 
And 2025, we should also see some small robo-taxi systems beginning to uh, bear out the business models for robo-taxis. And here is our former gubernator, uh, driven around by Johnny Cap here, and we can total recall. And then 2030, we should see some significant positive impact from robo-taxi systems. I'll go into those in a bit. And then at some point, you get enough critical mass on the freeway mobile cars that you can do some platooning and get some <coughs> nice network effects from that that sort of bring things back up. But you don't get that immediately. So let me go into the Read a Magazine robocar experience. So the regulator, regulators seem to be facilitating that. And the supply chain is really lowering the cost of entry to bring a car to market on that. Here's Juan Medford used to be with NHTSA and then Google hired him. And imagine experience where 95% of your freeway trips, you press a button and you get to read a magazine the whole way of your trip. But then 5% of the trips, the robot tells you to take over because of some issue. But still, pretty great experience. Um, but we get the induced demand effect. So Toyota says, well, you make driving easier so then people are going to live farther away. And Sven Beaker, who gave a talk here, previously at Avita, says this will steal its ridership away from transit. And you know that when you make the pain of driving single occupancy vehicles less, then people are going to be more likely to venture out at 845 when there's already a lot of crap congestion because they can read a magazine and they don't care about it. And so they've got a great commute, but they made the commute slightly slower for everybody else. And so if you imagine these are expensive cars with a high-end package, then the poor folks who can't afford these are going to suffer disproportionately. And Steve Schlatt over here has got a more pessimistic take on, uh, on the rollout of the self-driving car market. And there is a YouTube of uh, his meetup on the uh, last year that's worth watching. And it was interesting because I was, I was at Google when Steve presented his pessimistic outlook to the Google X self-driving cars team. And the next day, they did not stop their project, even though Steve had explained to them that they weren't going to be successful in commercializing. So there's a little bit of a controversy there. And we should see the self-driving robocars in places where it doesn't snow. And about 50% of the big metros in the US have six inches or snow or less per year. But the snow is hard to see in if you're a computer vision system. And again, you get the network effect when you get enough critical mass of the freeway road cars. And let's talk about some of the challenges with driving on surface streets, which is a lot harder than driving on freeways, which have got a lot fewer hazards. So here's an intersection in Palo Alto, an unprotected left turn. This is Alma, and cars are sometimes going 50 miles per hour here. And there are these beautiful street trees here that make your computer vision system not be able to see the cars coming right or left. And so it's pretty blind for a computer vision system, unless you've got a second pair of eyes hanging up in the trees here that gives you the line of sight you need. So uh, non-trivial for the self-contained Google self-driving car architecture to handle that left turn. And then merges are really hard because you're used to it. You're even reading the, the body language of the person you're merging with. And uh, robots have a little more trouble with that. And then there's some false positives, like when the computer vision sees a mylar balloon and thinks it's an anvil and comes to an abrupt stop and the car behind says that was a balloon. We just drive through it. So challenging, but uh, I think some vendors believe they can solve that problem. And let's go into the surface street robo taxi case here. So if you think about a system that's serving trips in a three mile radius, so just getting you from Caltrain to work or whatever, um, Here's the Nissan flavor of it with a suspiciously Uber-like interface. And so um, this robotaxi system makes Caltrain and carpooling more efficient because you're not stranded in the middle of the day. So you go from Caltrain to work, and then you go shopping in the middle of the day, and then you need to go get some sushi and <laughs> come back to work. So that's kind of a series of trips that you take in your robotaxi, alien with your smartphone. Um, Robotax system is going to do empty vehicle movements, which is a key technology. And it really needs, it has a chance to be competitive with a private auto, so it needs to be priced low like a private auto, which is pretty inexpensive. And this would provide great mobility for low income folks. And the question is, are we as a society going to be willing to provide that subsidy? 
Um, and again, I think for the business models, the more we can sub two or three people in those global taxis rather than one, the better everything's going to better everything's going to work out from a business model standpoint and also from an um, efficiency standpoint. And the hope is that the robo taxis give you the car sharing game, which is for every car sharing car, uh, ten private autos are pulled off the road. So this creates a big, you know, if you roll out lots of robo taxis, this creates a really big real estate imperative because that's a super valuable thing to do is bringing up real estate. So with about 20 Nissan employees, we ran a small suburban robo-taxi exercise without having any self-driving cars, but we still kind of faked it. And then also for commuting, we had a bunch of Nissan folks who were living in San Francisco and others living in Palo Alto. And we, to get critical mass, we sort of said, okay, everybody's gonna get on the 8.45 a.m. Cal train from San Francisco uh, to make our robo-taxi experience, our fake robo-taxi experience work well. So in suburbia, we achieved the world record single occupancy vehicle commute mode share, 21%, and we got 2.6% 2.6 average occupancy in the vehicles for trips, for commutes and trips out to lunch. So it was a pretty interesting exercise. And some of the feedback, again, what do people want? They want low price, they want no weight, they want great human machine interface, they want flexibility and freedom. And some folks like Greg thought it would be a really good idea to work on their laptop from the back seat as they got chauffeured around by the robo taxi to really see some nice productivity on their way into work. And if you have a robo taxi system, you're going to need a control room where you can tell the drive vehicles if the robo taxi finds there's a traffic hop in the way and um, you need to kind of nudge your way around that obstacle. And then I used to be a big fan of personal rapid transit, which is robo taxis up on their own roadway, 16 feet in the air, uh, transit version of robo taxis. Uh, but that technology has not really advanced. Um, but if it did come out, we could really see it in, for a lot of cars. Um, it has a lot of potential. And then another technology that I think is a kind of a killer is robo vans, say 10 or 15 passenger self-driving vans where, you know, right now it's pretty expensive to have a driver, but if you eliminate that, then it's very cost effective. So, you know, compared to public transit, which is maybe a dollar per passenger mile, imagine having a cost of a quarter of that, which may allow you to run transit at a profit. And instead of having one 50 passenger bus every 20 minutes, you can have one 12 passenger van every four or five minutes. So you can provide better service for that. And a good example of the notion is the Helsinki Kutsu Plus demand response minibus system, which is part of Helsinki's car-free effort. Um, and then I think also we'll begin to see experiments with maybe containerized uh, personal deliveries to people's homes. Um, and unfortunately, the, the robot taxi experience is always that the business model says you've got to fire the drivers. Right? Actually. Where you get the profit. Um, so again, uh, thank you. And for Q and A, again, I wanted to tee up if people have you know a couple main things they could say, but would be different in their 2025 forecast. So thanks. Okay, thanks, Steve. If you want to ask a question, raise your hand. I want to bring in the mic so everyone can hear. Here we go. Thanks, Steve, for a fun presentation. <clears throat> so back to your work on PRT, and you said that you think it has a lot of potential, but really hasn't advanced. So what hasn't it done, and what could it do that would advance it? Make it so it could have finally reach that potential. So there are three personal math and transit systems operating for road operating very reliably, but there are small systems with about two or three stations in them, so they're not very spectacular, up in the air, and they are actually self-driving cars, which is pretty interesting, but they're in a controlled environment because they're on their own roadway with no obstacles. And for, say, a system for Google Campus to connect to Caltrain, you need a pretty high capacity version of it. So you need the sh they're running about four-second headways, which is 
don't remember the distance off the top of my head, but you need them running closer to bumper to bumper. So if the technologists in the self-driving car space would actually focus on fixing personal rapid transit, that would be a great way to go. But that's not happening. So that that industry is really languishing. But potentially San Jose State will fix that. Let's hope you do not. You didn't mention uh, hydrogen, which was promoted recently at the North American Auto Show and the Geneva Auto Show. That has been touted by many people as a solution to the infrastructure problem of how do we reuse gas stations uh, at an affordable cost. Are you negative on hydrogen? Or? I am not negative on hydrogen. But I did hear a negative hydrogen story yesterday that said what there's like. 20 or 100 hydrogen vehicles in all of California, and there's a big program to put in $2 million hydrogen gas, hydrogen uh, gas stations and gas stations. Uh, but it's just you know, a crazy spend of public sector money that's not justified. And then, you know, continuing on this bashing, I think the, the estimated mile per gallon, once you went through everything and transported the hydrogen, was 45 mile per gallon. So, it, you know, it's just, you might as well make ethanol. Thanks a lot for the talk. You mentioned this trans she would shared cars or rover taxes. So when you see this trend that we got aerial trans and you have autonomous cars that are shared, do you think they would also be expected to give themselves in the future? It's a facetious question in a way, but on the other hand, you know, I think one of the reasons people tend to own their cars is because we're okay with the messes we create them ourselves, but having to deal with everybody else's mess all the time is not very clean to many people. So if the car is autonomous, should we incorporate capability like that? Yeah, very much so. I mean, like the personal rapid transit systems that are operating at airports and such, uh, you know, there is a way to, if you're a passenger, to flag to the system operator that you've got a dirty vehicle, they'll take it out of service and clean it, but they also have a you know, pretty frequent maintenance and cleaning system on it to make sure everything seems very fresh. So you want to be able to flag a vehicle as needing clean, even though your experience may be a little bit messy while you're still taking the trip, but you want to make it, you know, the expectation would be that you take it out of service, help take it out of service so it doesn't irritate the next person. So, uh, you know, all kinds of things where you want a really great customer experience, and especially on a new technology. So you don't want any kind of turnoffs like that. Uh, things that go wrong, much like in robo cars, you don't want one automaker rushing the market and having a lot of crashes or something and ruining the reputation for everybody, right? So you want to have kind of more bulletproof experiences because the expectations are so high for new technology. So we'll have fewer drivers, but more. <coughs> <laughs> no, I wish. No. Hi, Steve, thanks. Why are you so negative uh, or pessimistic on platooning? The technology for that is probably simpler than what it's for autonomous driving. So, why is that so far out? Oh, just because I think, it's just my argument is that it has to hit a, a certain scale, a certain, certain market penetration. I'm right, thinking that with. 5% market penetration, you'd still be forming routines for commuting on 101. I can imagine there's incentives for it. You use the HOV lane, and there's massive uh, fuel consumption reductions. Uh, the transport station uh, tracking could use it for long haul trips. So the technology could be ready, and it could be, pin uh, could be out pretty soon. Do we really, really need to wait for it to penetrate that deeply for it to have an effect? So, I exactly think what you're saying it could have some impact sooner than what I'm saying. Like that. This may seem like a crazy question, but could uh, short-range air travel in any way ameliorate any of these things? Like, for example, you mentioned Amazon Fresh, and know that Amazon has experimented with drone delivery. Uh, even that may be uh, eliminating the need for people to go to the grocery store as often or something. 
see that as being a non-negligible factor, possibly? The experts on the, you know, how cost-effective that is, and efficient that is. What's that? Expensive passenger mile right now. Yeah, so right now it's pretty expensive. Just because you have to let that sucker off the ground. You mentioned um, uh, pricing schemes for offsetting congestion. Have you looked at the ideas like Balaji Prabhakar has been experimenting with in Stanford lotteries, nudging incentives rather than penalizing as alternatives to, and is that a realistic? So if you could. <laughs> What is it? In, in, in India, to get you to commute not at 9 a.m. but at 10 a.m., you get a small value lottery card that can give you a big payout. So the cost to implement that is really cheap to shift people away. Um, and so if you can replicate that, then it's super cost effective compared to, say, I take $2 from somebody for parking and I have to pay out $3 to somebody for a carpool. So it hasn't been shown in the US, like the Stanford experiment, uh, they were basically paying people who were already commuting off peak, right? So it wasn't, wasn't super cost effective or anything as far as I know. Um, but I mean, I, you know, it's, I, it's a holy grail if you can really reduce the cost of incentives to change the behavior, right? And I just wonder if, you know, at some point, you're commuting 240 days a year, um, you can't be sort of gimmick out of it because it's so integral to your living. You know, I, I wonder. But all upside, right? It seems like on, on vaporage they should just run the experiment because we're all instrumented now anyway. We're all carrying smartphones. It would be so easy to run an experiment. Yeah, you cross and then you get a big, yeah. big LCD. He says, you want to like over like, 10 minutes. Steve, thanks for the talk. Um, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about uh, the discussions you've had about transit and how uh, we could really see this exciting future where transit is more efficient, it's um, safer, of course, all of the all of the added benefits with autonomous vehicles. Um, can you talk about how you imagine actual transit agencies taking on uh, this technology and becoming transit for the future. I know that there are some agencies like uh, in Eugene, Oregon, we've talked about the um, Emerald Express bus rapid transit taking on a little bit of automated features, but um, you know, certainly the stereotype of transit agencies is that they're um, <coughs> slow to take on innovations for a variety of reasons. So would this future be all private shuttles and buses? Is this today's transit agencies taking on tomorrow's technologies? Can you talk a little bit about that? So I, I'm encouraged that VTA has a new head who's pro innovation and they have hackathons and things and a transport innovation zone and stuff. And so they're really kind of talking to talk about being more innovative and, and flexible. Um, and you want to sort of be able to experiment with new services rapidly, see if they work, and then pull them away if they don't try something different. Um, when you eliminate the cost of unionized drivers, your public transit agency, you can do some, some pretty cost effective things and be pretty <coughs> competitive. Um, so there's good potential there for fast moving, flexible transit agencies. Um, the other big thing that the employers complain about in the Bay Area is that there's 29 different transit agencies and so you Got commuters going across three counties and they're screwed just because things don't work. And so consolidating all that and just, you know, just doing a big data problem to figure out what is the optimal way to route everybody and put the vehicles in the right place. Um, and for that, I'm much more confident that Lyft is going to solve that problem than VK is going to solve that problem. Um, but I also think it's going to be interesting if, if Google now and Microsoft Cortana really focus on that then going after that, you, know, you end up with a pretty strange business model where they're in the business of actually being a mobility operator. And it's just all this cash transacting through their, their phones. You know. um, so how's that for I don't know. <laughs> <laughs>
it, in your discussion on the robotic taxis, you mentioned reducing the number of vehicles by a factor of 10. Uh, but how about all the empty backhauls for repositioning those vehicles? Uh, might you not actually have an increase in the VMT because of all of that moving around? Yeah, that's our nightmare scenario, right? <coughs> yeah, but how do you avoid it? If you have, if you have an occupancy of 1.0 and then 40% of your trips are empty, then it's limited effectively occupancy of 0 0.7, right? And so that's another reason why you want to have an occupancy of 2.0 or more in the vehicle because if you have 40 or 30 percent of your trips empty vehicle movements, um, that's a big waste. And so, like the New York City taxi system is about, I think it's about 40 percent empty vehicle miles. Uh, and so, you're absolutely right. Uh, I, I suppose the other argument would be well, you can have this super clean fleet and it's a new system, so um, you can still have five mile per gallon, but you really don't want to increase the VMT and increase the congestion. That's not something that for a local. Robo taxi system, anybody's going to be very enthusiastic about it. Hi, uh, my name is Surya. Uh, I'd maybe like to agree, like, uh, for autonomous driving to really take shape, there needs to be infrastructure development that would kind of uh, support autonomous driving in some, some form or the other, like, you know, to kind of achieve the dependability. Are there any developments uh, on that front, like, for and yes, maybe a parallel infrastructure would develop that would really support autonomous cars and autonomous vehicles in some form or the other. Yeah, very much so. So the, the, the Google philosophy is to be self-contained as much as possible with LiDAR on top. And so do all your sensing on the vehicle. And if the VI is available, vehicle the infrastructure communication is available, exploit it, but not depend on that. Uh, so that's one interesting approach. And then there's the automakers tend to, when they think about surface driving, tend to think about more instrumentation and the vehicles talking to each other as well. And the Brad Templeton argument is that, you know, my gosh, you've got to have 100% penetration of the DSRC communications in all the vehicles to really make your safety case because you end up with these legacy vehicles that muck up your safety case when you're depending on that kind of communication. Yeah, but it, it has to develop in stages, like, you know, just like, the roads were paved with tar, like, uh, or paved, they developed in stages, like, but ultimately they have to support autonomous right. vehicles to kind of, you know, somebody has to take the liability to say you're self-contained, like, the car can never think like a man, like, he, you know. Right, right, and so and there's really good test beds going on in that, so Michigan and the San Jose Transportation Innovation Zone is attempting to do that. Um, Contra Costa's got a big test track, so there's a lot of good experimentation and rapid cycling going on. Yeah, I have, a, I have a question over here in the back. Um, so I don't know if I heard this wrong or if it was self selective hearing, but when you're talking about robo cars and robo taxis, do you think that will have an impact on kind of the, the location of where people are populating? So will there be kind of a, a shift towards reverse urbanization or something like that? Will it be maybe more effective for people who live outside of urban areas? So that's what Toyota said, which was a career limiting quote by Toyota, <laughs> was, was saying that, that if you, when you make driving easier, then people will live farther away. So they were saying that it was sprawling, which tends to be, right? Because instead of it being a 45 minute grind of a commute, now you're being productive. And it's, the time goes really fast. And you can also think, sort of, in the dystopian case, that all the elite tech workers live in Tahoe and frolic around <coughs> and commute in at 200 miles per hour for their, their meetings. They go back out and all the poor people live in the Bay So, uh, so seriously, the transportation plan, I think there's a slight sprawl reducing impact. I mean, there's a lot bigger change vectors going on that's, that's not going to be the biggest one by far, but it is a slightly relative. All right. Steve, can you hear me? All right, perfect. Um, that actually ties in beautifully with my question, where uh, you have sort of a, a utopian society, right, where you've got very sort of expensive robotics and infrastructure, and just boiled into San Francisco Bay Area, we've got Caltrain electrification coming finally in uh, 2019. We've got Trans Bay Terminal being built. We've got all these things happening. Um, so on the inverse, I'm just in terms of the opportunities where um, 
some low hanging fruit in terms of investment in infrastructure. Um, I, it kind of brings um, my question. I just got back from Colombia, and I spent some time in Bogota, and they have Transmilenio, which is an amazing bus system that instead of investing in a huge subway, they actually said, hey, how can we make this better? So it's, it's, it's elevated. It's actually one of the most amazing bus systems I've ever seen. And the ridership is like over 60, 68, 69%. Um, everyone respects it. It's very clean and safe. It was, it was awesome. Um, in Medellin as well, they have sort of a, a really intricate um, metro system that uh, was built after, uh, well, actually during Escobar, but then after it became just like the city's pride. And then they just extended it up into the barrios and the favelas with a metro cable. So, you know, people don't have to walk all the way up to their homes. They can actually ride like at an amusement park, a, a sort of metro cable funicular system to their home. And I guess if you could talk about ways to, that we can improve in the Bay Area maybe, so we don't have to spend trillions of dollars or billions of dollars, maybe some little things that we could, we could do, I guess. Right, right. So to me the answer is flexible transit in vehicles on highways and arterial streets and meeting the demand and pooling 10 people together and taking it 20 miles and, and really having a good big data approach to where all the trips are coming from, but you know, just sort of solving them one trip at a time and you know, there's not really that many sort of big pipe projects on the board that you can sort of reconfigure the Bay Area around. Um, like El Camino bus rapid transit is proposed, it's, it's not clear it's gonna, it's gonna get adopted, but that's probably not gonna be a killer thing just because there's not the density and activities along that. So oh, why don't I do this first slide just quickly, which is, just shows how tough it is, is that, um, all the jobs are located by the freeway offerings. They are 75% of them, right? So it's sort of, you know, everything is very, is built very auto-centered. And so in um, for Silicon Valley, all the big employers are far away from the Caltrain stations. Right? All the jobs are, and there's not, where there are job clusters like in Palo Alto by Caltrain, there's huge mode shift to Caltrain, it's great, but there's just, not much of that happening. So it's, you know, it's a plan or you, know, you look at all the trip originations and destinations and it's hard to come up with a killer project like the BRT in Columbia or whatever, which works so great. Um, so I think it's more ad hoc, but just knowing where everybody is and putting the right vehicle in front of them and getting other people into that same vehicle um, is probably the flexible way to go. So you basically have this bird's nest of trip vectors and it's just, you're trying to consolidate enough of those trip vectors that are trying to go in the same direction. But there's not that nice BRT flow like you'd like. <coughs> okay, just one or two more questions. Sir. Hi, Steve. Thanks for a great presentation. Quick question. Uh, V2V uh, mandate from NHTSA has gone cold, it seems like. What are your thoughts on that? That would potentially also make a better utilization of the highways and give us more capacity, so I'd be interested to hear what you have well, to say. Thanks. I was just noticing the new LiDAR on the Google cars today, so, yeah. And again, that's sort of the more self-contained and, you know, arguably go to market faster if they can for service street driving where they're not depending on other infrastructure. Um, so, I, I yeah, but LiDAR has, <laughs> LiDAR has uh, technical challenges that are not overcome easily and, and quickly. But uh, V2V communication is a mature communication that's been around for a long time and uh, also economically uh, very easy to implement. And uh, as shown on some pilots that actually has a good, good impact, reducing accidents also, you know, and, and having a better traffic flow. Uh, low cost. So, what, what are you thought? What is uh, why is uh, NHTSA gone cold on that? Because they were supposed to, after the 90 day uh, public comment, end of 2014, everybody expected that something would come up. Does anybody want to take that? So, I was just going to I'm not NHTSA. <laughs> but I happen to be the chair of the SAE DSRC Technical Committee, and we have a letter from NHTSA that says stabilize your standard by 
September for rulemaking. So the, it hasn't gone cold, it's in research, it's in standardization, but uh, the SAE standards and the underlying IEEE 1609 standards sure. are being worked on pretty assiduously in order for a rulemaking, which would be an NPRM process, to start probably before the end of the Obama administration. I'm not a politician, but that makes sense too, get that legacy started. So it hasn't gone cold, we've just been impatient. I know you've got 75 megahertz been sitting there for 15 years, buying fallow, but it's happening. Yeah, I know there are a lot of also regulatory challenges. There are many people like myself who make a livelihood out of it. So, <laughs> so I don't see people like the pigs. <laughs> Great, thank you very much. Okay, one, one more. Any other questions? One more? Here we go. So you mentioned a little bit about some of the challenges with you know, blind intersections and sensors. Um, I've worked a lot in the past with both military and avionic system developers and looking at the cost increases in those industries, um, both in aggregate and per line of code. You know, a new airframe, um, over half of the cost of the airframe is that a software validation. So you have one quarter is development of the hardware, one quarter is development of the software, half is the software validation, which can exceed $10 billion in airframe. Um, the software on these autonomous vehicles from having worked in this industry is much, much more complex with many, many more lines of code. I have a hard time kind of comprehending the level of complexity people are talking about with the fact that we don't have good validation techniques that are that are less than fifty dollars per <coughs> Any thoughts on, on how that's gonna affect things? And then also cost is gonna increase, and I suspect that this digital divide we already have with um, with, with all these other parts of the world, now it's on our way to transfer to, to the transportation and more so than it has been before. Only well-to-do people.